Joe Rogan, Patrick Bet David, Sean Ryan, the Flagrant Podcast all missed something that biblical scholar Michael Heiser pointed out years ago. People like Billy Carson are lying to you. So in your eyes, you think Jesus was an alien? I think Jesus was half human, half alien, and I'll tell you why. I was able to take stone tablets and decipher them myself. These gods, and I do mean gods with an S, because everywhere in the Bible where it says God singular, it's actually a mistranslation. I think that his message was pure and clean and clear that he was trying to usher back a, a, a level of Christ consciousness back in humanity. The second return, that's when Jesus comes back. He comes back in our minds. Now, before we unpack each of these claims that Billy Carson is making, I want to play a clip from Dr. Michael Heiser, who I think just does a fantastic job of engaging in the conversations that might otherwise be dismissed as like woo-woo or nothing. And, and he exposes the deeper underlying lying game of deception that's going on and ultimately points us to the answers. And so I want to play this short clip. It's going to kind of frame the rest of our conversation. So here's Dr. Michael Heiser. I think what's going on is we have intelligent beings, intelligent, non-human, divine, spiritual beings, whatever you want to call them, trying to control the language of spirituality. I think this is the goal of intelligent evil in this regard. Redefining things like God. What does that word even mean? Who are we? What does it mean to be human? How did we get here? Who put us here? And what is our destiny? How do we have, a, do we have a relationship with this God? Have we offended him? Is there such a thing as sin or not? But I think the intelligent evil wants to control and redefine the terminology. They want God redefined as a transcendent extraterrestrial. They want Jesus redefined as a messenger from the transcendent extraterrestrial or an extraterrestrial himself. Uh, they want the need of humanity, not equated with sin, a solution for sin, but to evolve, to be a transcendent being. This is something akin to, conceptually at least, when the Nahash, the serpent, walks up to Eve and says, hey, did God really say? And then they have a conversation where Eve is misled or misdirected, led to process what God said in a different way. Having the meaning of these terms altered, even slightly, we are embracing a non-gospel. We are embracing a different Christ. And I think that's actually the goal. And honestly, I'm just glad I get to share the work of Dr. Michael Heiser. It seems like Joe Rogan is aware of him, and I hope that he, be Joe and the people that are curious, like Joe is, become more and more aware of the, the amount of work that Dr. Michael Heiser put into these types of topics. You know, you're right. Skepticism really has an important role to play. It's it's very it's really it's really essential that we are skeptical. And Otherwise, we, we'd all be following Zacharias Hitchin well, and waiting for the Anunnaki to land. And e exactly. We would have sold our houses December twenty first, two thousand and twelve, and we'd all be going, "What the fuck? Now I'm homeless." <laughs> exactly. Four years later, and I have to say, there's a skeptic called Michael Heiser who has done really an excellent job of of thoroughly, you know, debunking the bogus translations of uh, Zacharias Hitchin. Yeah, is he Sitchiniswrong.com? Is that Sitchiniswrong.com. Yeah, it's a I, very I useful. It's a very useful site. So we I hated need, him and loved him at the same time. I, I feel, was so I've, sad. I love the idea of the aliens come down and manipulate manipulating the monkeys and making yeah. us to mine gold. It's a wonderful yeah. story. But unfortunately, it's a work of science fiction. It's yeah. not a work of fact. Damn it, uh, Zachariah. We, we, Zachariah Sitchin's work was like the most controversial mm -hmm. on the Sumerian text, right? Yes. Because there's a whole website called SitchinIsWrong.com <laughs> and people go crazy about him. So what are some of the things that Zachariah Sitchin teaches that I object to, again, as a biblical scholar? Well, let's start with one that everybody seems to have heard of, and that is Sitchin's idea that the Bible really teaches in Genesis 1, specifically Genesis 1, that Humanity was created by extraterrestrials, by aliens. And he gets this by talking about the word Elohim. Now in Genesis 1, 26, again, it's a very familiar verse. Uh, so God said, let us create humankind in our image and our likeness. And so God created uh, humankind, male and female, in his likeness. People will note uh, the, the plural language there, and they'll also point out that, well, God, the word for God there is Elohim. And Elohim in Hebrew is a plural. These gods, and I do mean gods with an S, because everywhere in the Bible where it says God singular, it's actually a mistranslation. The actual, if you backwards uh, look up the translation in Arabic and then down to Aramaic and everything else, you find that it's God's plural. And if you don't have, again, facility in the ancient languages or at least you know, Hebrew, you could be misled by this. Sitchin fundamentally misunderstands the term Elohim and he fundamentally misunderstands Genesis 1:26 because he ignores grammar. Now, let's just start with the word Elohim and then we'll talk about what the verse actually is describing. Elohim is spelled as a plural. The I-M ending on Hebrew nouns is the sign of the plural. But that doesn't mean that it points to plural beings. In the Genesis 1 passage, when Elohim actually creates humans, male and female, in Genesis 1.27, all of the verbs are singular. 
subject verb agreement. It's grammar. This tells you that a singular God is the creator. And not only in Genesis 1, but every passage in the Hebrew Bible that talks about the creation of humanity is always with singular verbs. Every one of them. It's entirely consistent. So when Sitchin says that Elohim means that we were created by multiple extraterrestrials or a team of extraterrestrials, he's not telling you the truth. This is a misunderstanding, whether it's him being ignorant of the situation or something more deliberate, I don't know, but it is not the truth. Now, Zachariah Sitchin, you know, I don't particularly uh, go by his work, uh, not because it's controversial. I believe he was one of the greatest researchers of all time. And the reason why is because he laid out so, many, so much information for us to begin to scratch our head and ask questions. But what I figured out was that by going through the UCLA, UCLA CDLI, online, online cuneiform digital library, say that fast 10 times, I was able to take stone tablets and decipher them myself. So anyone can go online to the UCLA CDLI online cuneiform digital library and, and read these stone tablets for themselves. You don't need Zachariah Sitchin. You don't need anyone else. And as I began to break these tablets down. Do they have them transcribed or are you reading the actual tablet? You can, they, they transcribe them. They actually transcribe them into English for you. Now, a lot of what Billy Carson is claiming has to do with his access or knowledge of these emerald tablets of Thoth. He's very specific about the emerald tablets of Thoth and not just the emerald tablets that are associated with Hermes, which are called the Hermetica. But let's just go ahead and take a look at this online digital library that he refers to and see what we can find. Now, there are tablets that you can view on this database, on this website, but do any of them have to do with the claims that Billy Carson is making? When you go to the digital library that he refers to, there are no results for Emerald Tablet of Thoth, Emerald Tablet, Emerald Tablets, the word Emerald does not appear, the word Hermetica does not appear, which would be the tablets associated with the Greek god Hermes, and Hermes and Thoth are connected in the Egyptian tradition. And um, the Hermetica is the 8th century, the reference to the 8th, is referenced in an 8th century work, so it has a little bit more historical backing than the stuff that Billy Carson is talking about. But um, yeah, there's no tablets on the CDLI cuneiform digital library that refer to what Billy Carson is claiming. In the Joe Rogan interview, the tablet that they are looking at is actually the tablet for the Epic of Gilgamesh. It has nothing to do with the claims that Billy Carson is making or has little to do with the claims that Billy Carson is making. Could be oh, pieces okay. chipped off of tablets. Right. You see that corner missing from that tablet right there in the Epic of Isn't Gilgamesh. That, just look how, how wild is that? Yeah. One of the other things about these tablets is it seems like Billy Carson is very specific about them being the tablets of Thoth, not to be confused with the emerald tablets that are associated with Hermes or the Hermetica. So we're talking about the final two tablets of the emerald tablets of Thoth, the plural tablets, because there's two versions of the emerald tablets. There's an emerald tablet of Hermes, which is singular one, which is located in Cambridge at the Cambridge uh, University. And then the emerald tablets of Thoth, which were written between 36 to 38,000 years ago are actually in the Vatican archive now. That's where they reside after being rediscovered uh, and brought back to Egypt in the 1920s. He's speaking about the tablets of Thoth. Now this sounds very familiar. So hang in there while we connect some dots. This is a supposed translation of the tablets of Thoth by a man named Maurice Doriel. He was a cultist. He was not a translator, and it does appear that a lot of what he wrote might have been a plagiarism from H.P. Lovecraft's classic horror fiction. And it sounds very similar to some of the claims that Billy Carson is making, particularly about how the God can reincarnate and rejuvenate over and over again and live on until it eternity. So I find this potential very interesting. And if it's true, then Billy Carson is really just recycling all the old lies from all the old cult classics. And, you know, I, I mean, he's making a lot of money doing it. And so you can kind of understand his motivation there, unfortunately, deceiving lots of people in the process. So let me know what you think about this Doriel Lovecraft connection. There is a website that I will link and you can look at that as well, connecting the work 
of Maurice Doriel, the cultist, to the fiction writer H.P. Lovecraft, and then sift that through what Billy Carson is saying, and you kind of hear the same themes. But you let me know.